Hello, I'm Leon Conrad, and I'd like to take you through a video that outlines an online course I've put together about George Spencer Brown's Laws of Form. It was a book that was published in 1969 that was revolutionary at the time and has become something of a cult classic. In this video, I'm going to cover seven things which form the outline of this course. But I'll go over them briefly here. First of all, what's so special about Laws of Form? Well, I think the best way to explain one of the things that's very, very special about it is to look at the cover from, I think, the 1979 paperback edition of it. As you'll see, three letters are highlighted. They evoke the sound of the Buddhist chant, Om. Now, this relates to the creation of the universe, bringing itself into being in and of itself. And this was an idea that was at the heart of Spencer Brown's work. Something created in and of itself. And that is how the whole calculus he presents starts. Moreover, these three letters are shown surrounded by two primary and one secondary colour. That also has resonances in the calculus. You take two primary axioms and you blend them and amalgamate them, combine them, to form a whole universe. Enough said, let's move on. So I'll go through these things in much more detail. What have people done with it? It's not just an airy-fairy idea that has no substance in reality. People have actually done really exciting and useful stuff with it. Not just theoretically, but also practically. It's been used practically in revolutionising engineering and circuit design and programming. Both George Spencer Brown himself and his brother, David, and William Bricken, have used it to do really interesting things in terms of circuitry and programming. George Spencer Brown applied it in uh, programming signals for British Rail so that a train could go into a tunnel and reverse and they would know exactly how much of the train was still in the tunnel, if any. It's been used in knot theory, it's been used to explore the foundations of mathematics, it's been used to come up with new calculi, it's been used to research in biology, it's been used to research in sociology, it's been applied to cybernetics and systems theory. There's a huge body of work in that field. Uh, Lou Kaufman, John Mingus and myself has, have explored its application to logic and I've shown how it can be usefully and very interestingly applied to the practice of perennial classical logic. I've also taken it into the study of grammar, language, story structure, looking at the deep structures of how these things work. Most people have looked at it in terms of sociology, mathematics. I haven't. I've taken it into language, and that's the area I'm interested in. People like Randy Dybel have taken it into philosophy and shown how laws of form links to um, really er early ideas that were being bandied about by the pre-Socratics. And it's not just airy-fairy theoretical and practical. There's also a heartbeat to it. There's an imaginative part of the work, which is really rich and valuable. There have been poetic responses to it, uh, some from myself, George Spencer Brown himself, used it to create poetry and inspire his writing. George Bennett Stewart has produced stories based on it, which I was very thankful for because they gave me a really easy introduction into the power of the system before I had encountered the rather off-putting to a newbie way in which the calculus is presented. It's very minimal, beautifully minimalistic, and it takes time to get to know it. But it's definitely worth getting to know. But there are easy ways into it, and I'm trying to make this easy for you as well. And the whole thing, the one of my favourite aspects of it, is the integrative approach, which Kurt von Meyer explored in the 70s. And this is in the spirit of his work. The real question is, what can you do with laws of form? 
I like putting people in the deep end straight away. That way you will, in a safe environment, be able to explore what it's like to swim about in these waters. Well, we'll take something that looks like this and we'll play. And any good game needs a set of rules. And the rules for this game are very simple. If you have two marks that are side by side, you can condense them into one, like that. If you have two marks, one on top of the other, you can just cancel them out, like that. You have a pair of marks nested, one on top of the other, that can get cancelled. The next pair can get cancelled. That leaves another pair, which can also get cancelled. And the value of this expression ends up as being a marked state. And what's beautiful about this is that you can reconstruct the sequence. You can put this in, you can add your pair of unmarked states, and you can add another one and another mark beside the one you originally had. And you have the original expression. And just to remind you, here's how it resolves. Now, you can see that it's quite fun, quite easy. And to get specific, we look at the basic axioms in quite a lot of detail and in depth that Spencer Brown starts his book with. First of all, the law of calling, and secondly, the law of crossing. From there, I go through laws of form, chapter by chapter, proof by proof. You see, in the book, George Spencer Brown does cover things very thoroughly. He's writing a modern equivalent of Euclid's elements. So here. And he represents the whole foundations of arithmetic, algebra, logic, and shows how this can be applied to almost anything because he's mapping the building blocks and process on which the whole universe depends. You get two thirds of the way through the book and you meet an expression like this. It's consequence eight, which demonstrates the principle of modified transposition. And he says, our job is to prove that the left-hand side of the equation is equal to the right-hand side of the equation using what we've already established as part of the calculus. Well, his presentation looks like this in the book. It's very brief and it's in shorthand form. What I do is show how every step breaks down in detail. And you will have gone through the previous steps, but I go through every one in detail as we come to it and discuss how each step leads to the final proof. Then I'm going to give you a little taster as to how it's used in logic. And there's a full course on this if you're interested. The four basic propositions of logic can be symbolized in symbolic shorthand very easily using Spencer Brown's system. The A proposition, all A is B, can be symbolized as A mark B. The I proposition, some A is B, can just be symbolized using two letters, A, B, some A is B. The E proposition, which is no A is B, can be symbolized as A mark, B mark. And the O proposition as A, B mark, some A is not B. Put those pairs of propositions together and you have something that looks like this in the four figures. And just by looking at how a uh, syllogism is notated, you can easily, if you know the laws of logic, find out whether a syllogism is valid or not. You don't have to draw complex Venn diagrams. You don't have to do the tests. You can just look at it and know. And as for how it applies to story, well, it reveals very exciting uh, insights into the deep workings of story. And you only need six symbols from laws of form to map the huge phenomenon of story and identify different story structures and what makes them work. We start with story openings and closings. The once upon a time, they lived happily ever after moves. And then 
we use the mark to identify each character in a story. The unmarked state, the mark over mark, indicates in some story structures a qualitative change in the relationship between the knower and the known. A backward step involves a character facing a hindrance that stops them from resolving a problem they face, and this applies to meetings. And a forwards move, forward step, takes them towards a solution to their problem. When you have a double barb, there's some kind of cognitive, uh, cognitive dissonance, a conflict there, that needs to be resolved. And that phenomenon distinguishes particular kinds of story structures. As I said, you only need six symbols. And it is the type of singles, symbols, the minimum number required to tell a story, that distinguishes one structure from another. What's interesting is that this system allows indefinite expansion and minimal contraction. It's very flexible. You don't need extra systems. You don't need extra extensions. You don't need expansion packs. All you need is six symbols. If you're interested in taking it further, look out for the next video in the series which is all about the basics of Laws of Form.